Hey everybody, it's Adam from IHP. We're here for another episode, episode eight of JC Unplugged. Um, here with the staff. JC, you're heading out to China tomorrow. Who are you talking to over in China? The trainers. Uh, we're going to Beijing and possibly Shanghai. We're not sure. Um, I, I kind of don't know a lot when I travel. I get there and it's rock and roll time. They take me wherever it is and I do the dog and pony show. So. And when do you come back? Come back next Tuesday. So we're going to be there for a full six days, I think it is. Right. I think it's five day of touring. You know, you got 23 hours to 23 hours back. So, so next up, plug, you can give us a little update of what you did over there. Yeah, yeah. China's always, the whole Orient uh, is, is booming, middle class is exploding. So they're opening gyms faster than they can supply them with good trainers. So that's how fast it's growing. So, the, so it's a beautiful market for the Mike Boyles, the great cooks, and people like that that educate, Mark Rooney's and all those, they're having a field in that because it's a big place. It's a big place and there's a lot of people, so good all stuff. Right, let's get into episode eight here. Um, last unplug, I mentioned that single leg training transfers to two leg performance, but two leg training may, may not have the same transfer to single leg performance. So this next question kind of came out of that statement that I made. Right. Um, and it says, so the question is, I'll just read it and I'll kind of paraphrase a little bit. In the previous episode of JC Unplugged, you discussed that using Olympic lifts in the A-frame, so bilateral stance, does not translate well to single leg activities. Therefore, during power and power endurance phases, should we be using more unilateral explosive movements after the traditional exercise to get more out of the oh, power? that's a good question. Yeah. Huh, that's a good question. Um, I would say the answer right off the bat, if I had to say, um, I would say use both. Why? Um, and, and that is why when, we, when we're doing our setup for our hybrid training, let's say the legs, right? We go squat usually, we go lunge and deadlift, or, or an equivalent. Okay, this could be a leg press, this could be a step up, this could be a good morning or a 45 degree. Why? Because when we're doing our hybrid training, we want to make sure we cover the A-frame here, Okay, we want to make sure that we cover the seven frame here and we want to cover the hip hinge here. So we cover everything. That's why our cookie cutter has this setup, parallel, single leg or stagger and hip hinge. So you don't have to think about it if you're going with our template because here you will have a squat parallel with a vertical jump or a squat jump. Here you will have it with a um, uh, box shuffle, one leg, box push off, right? There and then here you can have a burpee or a box jump or something like that. So you'll already have your unilateral. Now, if you are involved in a really uh, in an exercise, let's say or an activity like soccer, that's mostly running, running, running. This could easily be a single leg, okay, uh, leg press, okay, or a Bulgarian squat or a step up lunge. This could be a lateral reaching lunge, and this would still be a hip hinge because I'm, I'm not losing the hip hinge. Right. So depending on your activity, you can focus more on the seventh frame or on the eighth frame. If the person needs overall strength, I like this because you can just pull more weight. It does a lot for the neural inputs, does a lot for the, you know, the whole thing, all right? But from a functional standpoint, this dominates most sports, most sports. And you will have two-legged jumping in things like volleyball, basketball, uh, and stuff like that. So if this is uh, part of your activity, you can have it. But we can still do, we can do a parallel stance squat here and do maybe a single leg squat jump here, maybe off of the MVP. You can do, yes, you can mix A-frame traditional with seven frame jump. The whole thing is, I like to keep the specific specific. You know, so if I'm, if I'm banging the A-frame, normally I'm using more weight, maybe the neural impulse is a little bit heavier, that kind of stuff, I like that to, to be followed up. Uh, Okay. Just a preference. Uh, before we go on to the next question, so when you walked in today, I stopped you and asked you, one of the things that we don't do here is do unstable surface training for the purpose of transferring power. Right. So we, we get that we know. But I did ask you, what about using an unstable, unstable surface for the purpose of hip, knee, and ankle stability? And you said, no, 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 because what is stability? Okay, think about this. What is simple? I don't want to get into crazy biomechanical definitions. If you look up Webster's, one of the definitions will be resistance against unwanted motion. 
period. So just the definition tells you that you're not here. Now granted, if you're balancing, you don't want this motion and you don't want that. So there's little mi micro adjustments. But you don't find that high level of proprioception with low intensities when you're batting, when you're golfing, even when you're running and you put your foot on the ground with five times body weight, that's not this. That is bam. And when you hit a rock and, you're and your foot does that, and here's your knee and here's your hip, okay? If your knee goes this way, you're done. So what do you want? Do you want pliability here? You don't want this thing going you want this thing stiffening up as much as possible and lose as much as you can. This, if should it go down, you need that thing stiff while the angle is inverted. Okay? Alright, so you need stiffness. You need stiffness here to keep this from rolling this way. So if the if the rock is on this side, even worse, what, what happens? You need stiffness here to keep this, because if this reacts to that, it drives this into internal rotation, drives the knee inward, and there goes your ACL. Goodbye. So, ACL ruptures because there's unwanted rotation. And that unwanted rotation is usually predicated by foot contact. Person putting foot contact in, and it may be just a slight angle that they have, bam, this goes in. So again, stiffness is the end, end game. Stiffness from a strength transfer and from a protection standpoint. Now, the question is, when would we use unstable training? When would we use that? You know, and, I, and I've said that many times. The proprioception that you get from balance training is awesome to make sure that the channels are working. So if I'm calling Chris and it's a brand new phone line, should we be back in those days? Phone lines, okay, because we're not Bluetooth. The body doesn't have Bluetooth. The body's wired by nerves. It, there's no Bluetooth or, or Wi-Fi in the body. Everything's got connections, direct connections, right? So it's an old, old uh, Southern Bell system and an old, old Florida power and light system. It's routing through cables, with nerves, right? But if something happens, normally the body protects itself by going bam, bam, just like Florida power and light. There's pro problems in a transform, it throws fuses to protect this million dollar transform. Got it? So, we come back, we close the fuse, we lay the lines down. Now, this balance is the equivalent of me going, Chris, check, one, two, three, can you hear me? Talk to me, blah, blah, blah. There's no purpose of that communication other to make sure that we have communication. Once that communi that's balanced. Once that communication is, is established, we've got a good line, I don't keep calling Chris, check, one, two, check, one, two. The next time I call him is, Chris, meet me at IHP at eight o'clock. That is specific proprioception. That has to be running. That has to be your lateral reaching lunges. That has to be your anterior reaches. That has to be the stuff we do. Okay, at the speeds that you need to do it, with the loads you need to do it, that's the proprioception on the other. So the balance is just running neural transfer. Now, does that help power? There is the myth. And there was some talk about uh, research that was done by the Russians that that line of communication kind of lubes, lubricates the, the the um, uh, the pathways, and then and then neural communication can go faster. That hasn't been that that hasn't been proven conclusively to, to my taste at all. Doesn't even make sense. So I don't buy into that theory, and I don't train that theory, and it seems to have worked out pretty good for us. That was just a sidebar question, since I. It's a very interesting question because there's a lot of unknown, and when you have a lot of unknowns, you've got a lot of theories that can be. Um, proposed and then a lot of you know uh, then it's a lot of equipment that can be sold. We, then somebody was in here trying to sell us thirty thousand, not sell us, give us thirty thousand dollars worth of proprioceptive equipment. We would need a room this size to, to to house everything they wanted to give us. Okay, and I'm going. This doesn't even make sense, man. We don't do this. You know, so. Right. So next question: What do you look for when buying supplements? Maybe you start off with what are some of your not maybe just yours, but supplements that everybody should have. Are there some specifics? You know, I tell you, when something is in my wheelhouse, I tell you, when something's not, I tell you. I am not a, I'm not up to date on compounds. I'm not up to date on the latest nutritional uh, 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 research. I'm not up 
the data on how to figure out what companies are doing the best jobs and what supplements. I, I, for me to do that will take time away from what I study and what I'm good at. So when I have a problem, I have like three people I call. Joey Antonio, Doug Cowman, and Cliff Edgar. Those guys, that's what they do. And that's how I found, for example, Ocean Blue Pro 2100. That's the fish oil that I use, right? Been using that for two years now. That's available at the Publix Pharmacy. It's not available anywhere else, and it's available on Amazon now, because everything's available on Amazon. How did I find that out? Well, I was using a fish oil that was awesome, okay, but a little on the pricey side. And of course, 2008 rolls around, nobody's got money, so you gotta be, you know, frugal. So, I'm going, I can't spend, what I'm spending is like $300 a, a month on fish oils, because this thing was really expensive. So I called, called Doug Count and said, Doug, I can't, I can't use this fish oil anymore, this is just too pricey for me. Do you know anything? He goes, I'm gonna give you a pearl. He goes, nobody knows about this. Ocean Blue, uh, Ocean Blue 2100 Pro. It is amazing. He, apparently he did some, uh, some studies on it, or he knows the person who did, and it's clean. Well, lo and behold, I think that is the same oil that I was using before. Because all this oil basically comes out of one or two companies, and they all do the same thing. So it all depends on who buys it, how they mark it up, how they sell it, and the same oils can be bought here for 32 bucks, and the same, the same identical oil for the same account can cost you 115 here. It's just a little different package. So that's how I found out about this. Uh, hey man, while well, I was on the phone, I said, like, dude, do you have anything on the multivitamin and multimineral? Because the same thing. Twin Lab daily, don't get it with iron, because the one with iron is for women, the one without iron is for dudes. One phone call, man. I, I would have had to have been on the internet for days to get that. And so I have my three sources. So if you guys are wondering how to do that, Find, find somebody you trust, two or three people, and then call them. You don't have to know anything. So I don't know how to do that. So multivitamin, fish oil, the big the, the big, the big ones that we have are, if you're not on fish oil, you Multi, okay, multi, and I use Twin Lab. Twin Lab, uh, daily. I do one a day, two a day if I'm running, you know, running around. I go uh, vitamin D3, from Gerald. No particular reason, I kind of like it, it's been fine, great, and I go 5,000 use, uh, 5,000 I use, you are international units. I go, uh, let me see, uh, fish, fish oils, ocean blue, uh, 2100 Pro. They have a, a couple, and, you know, that's the highest dose. That's my meat and potatoes right there. Bam. This is the highest efficiency worldwide, okay? Now, I'm also adding a little, few other things, which is zinc, magnesium, uh, chondroitin, sulfate for my arthritis, and all that stuff. This and whey protein are the ones that we rock and roll with. Uh, here I go Labrata. Labrata Lean Body or the Iso Pure. Really tasty, super concentrated. So that's it. I'm a simple guy. If you got uh, to get started, that I would say would be covering 80% of everything you need. What are your thoughts on creatine? Creatine, sorry, that's right, I forgot. So for sports, Or super super high chain that go creatine and beta alanine. All right, creatine uh, is for energy inside the muscle cell. Beta alanine is for buffering hydrogen under high levels of. of uh, so this works through the carnosine chain and this works through the phosphogen chain. Uh, so this one has a tendency to volumize a little bit, so you might gain initially. Two, three, four, five pounds, depending on how big you are. This one here, no weight gain. So if you're working with wrestlers or anybody who needs to control their weight, this is good here. If you're, need, uh, if you're uh, training with someone that doesn't care about weight, this one is good. And both com combinations are also awesome. Uh, I, I personally don't use any of this. Uh, I'm here, and that's cool. So, by the way, creatine, the highest uh, concentration of research right now for creatine are, are in two, two populations. Uh, 
anything having to do with neurological diseases, all right, and ADD in kids. So if, if you ask Joey Antonio, he's had his kids on creatine yeah. since they were babies. Babies, he would sneak it into their yogurt, into their cereal. He has not taken them off through, from the time they came out. He's a big believer in this. ADD, uh, Parkinson's, uh, neuropathies, Alzheimer's. If it has to do with the brain, this thing we're finding out is one of the best brain foods ever. So, and not, and not just Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, but the older population, even ch children that are born with neurological disorders, right. they're given creatine. Yeah. If it has to do with the brain and, and nerves, neurons, this thing here. All right. So back to the good stuff. Um, What's the main biomechanical differences between a front and a back squat? The amount of knee and hip involved. So, front squat, okay? You have the tendency to have to be here. Okay? All right? There it is, okay? So, since it's to the front, you cannot have that forward lean that most people would have if they don't have this kind of hip flexibility. You need a specific type of hip and knee to be able to get into this position. All right? If you're doing a back squat, the back squat has more of a this. Okay? So the main difference is these guys here. Okay? Much more knee involvement here with a very, very flexible hip. Very, very, very strong lower back here because this is more like a good morning. Like our ugly squat is kind of in here. The squat we do with our people is kind of in here, which is very forgiving on the hips and the knees and really targets that lower back. So you don't need a bazillion pounds to get some good lower back because it's all about the, the lever arm. Look at the lever arm here, how long it is. Look at the lever arm here, and look at the lever arm here. Huge lever arm, smaller lever arm, smallest lever arm at the spine, L4, L5. But look at the knee involved. Less knee flexion, less, I mean more knee flexion, and the most amount of knee flexion. So there it lies the differences between traditional front and this ugly squat that we do, which is a combination of good morning, RDLs, and, and a squat. Now, people might argue that this here, we're not getting a ton of mobility going on versus the mobility that you're getting here. But if you want to do this squat and not have your ass to grass, so to speak, mm -hmm. you can get your mobility from other ways. You can get your mobility through a goblet squat and get good mobility. I see this as more than a lot of good strength training going on. But here's the question. Here's the question. What mobility? What mobility? What? Who? Who said that this was mo this mobility was superior to this mobility? Who said that? It's a longer range of motion, but who said that that range of motion is even appropriate, necessary, or effective? Nobody said anything about that. Oh well, we were born to squat. We show you the picture of the kid. The kid is a year old and he weighs 35 pounds. Now you're 35 years old and you can't translate that movement with 200 pounds on your back, all right, to a kid who's one years old. It's, it's look, I used to sell it because that's how I sold it when it was sold to me. Oh, knee flexion is 135 degrees, that's natural. And I would show the picture of the same kid with the diapers in a full squat and say, look, and then you, sell, you show the picture of the Aborigines dude, sit down, like ass the grass with a little stick, no teeth, Look, see, they do that when they're young, they do that when they're old, that's natural. And then we would show somebody in a full snatch or clean, you know, with two times body weight on top of their, on top of their shoulders. I'm going, it's not the same thing. It's not the same thing. The only athlete that I know that gets down there, and you know this, all kinds of uh, havoc is, 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 you know, cause on the knees, are catchers. And they're not, now they're even having equipment behind the knees to try to help them get in that position because most catchers end up with knee problems. And they're unloaded. They're unloaded, but it's just the position that's there and there and there. You're older and you weigh 200 pounds. That's not the same thing as a baby. So why is this even necessary? If you look at all sporting, all sporting, the 
resisted. Talk about resisted. You can't take a picture. Okay, you can't take a picture of a wrestler in a full takedown position with the knee, you know, the guy's here, and he's here, all right? You know, boom. You can't take a picture of that. He, there's no resistance. This knee's going to go like this, and he's going to soon be here. Or here. He's going to soon be here and transitioning. Or here, you know. As he, as he drives. This is not being decelerated. This is just going to go down and hit the canvas. Okay? So you don't have to train this position because this position is in transition. People see this position and go, oh, let's do lunges with the knee over the foot because look, he does it. No, he doesn't do it. This thing is going over. It's not coming back. So that's why you have to train a video. You can't train a position. We were talking about last one on vectors versus position, right? So just because you have this doesn't mean you train that. It's in transition. Now, if you see when we actually put forces on the ground, rarely will you see more than that on the left. Rarely. It's 25, 30 degrees at most. Anybody who drops below 45 is going down. Or it's stopping. Or it's doing it real slow. There's nobody that's rebounding real quick from anything more than, I would say, 25, 30 degrees. So when you look at that, what am I, what am I doing squats for? What am I doing leg exercises for? For a powerful lower body. For what? For running. What's the biggest angle of knee flexion you see in running or hip flexion? Nothing, man. 15 degrees. All right, how about soccer? Okay, show me a big, deep soccer position. You'll see 25 degrees, 30 degrees at best. Okay, then they'll show you the, the, the catcher. Okay, zero weight. Zero weight. You don't have to squat them deep. So when you look at why mobility, look at what kind of mobility, you know? I see this as less about the actual exercise and more about the performance needs of the athlete. But why are you training? Right. Why are you training? Are you training to be a good squatter? Or are you using squat to be a good jumper, a good runner, or change the directions? Okay, runner, jumper, change the directions. All right, let me see the angles needed for that. And you'll see that you're way over way over those angles, and now here you run into a problem because now you're limited to the weak angles of the motion which are not used to begin with. So you're not even doing something optimally loaded for the activity because you're lost in this full range of motion stuff that we bought somewhere along the ways, and now you're limited to the weakest angle in that range to the load that you're using. So you're not even using optimal loads because you're relegated, you're, you're limited by the weakest angle, which is not even used in the activity. That's insane, man. That's insane. Hmm? So imagine that. We should officially change this from JC unplugged to JC unhinged. <laughs> but, but it's amazing. No, it's, a, it's amazing. They're right. right. And nobody, I mean, this ain't, this ain't rocket science. This is just, okay, stop. What do I need? I need silver. So why are we making gold? Because gold is good. I need silver. But let's make gold. That's the insanity, you know? All right. You okay? No. <laughs> Would you say a front squat is more functional? Because in everyday life, for the everyday person, if you're going to lift something, lift the couch, lift the baby anything, you're going to lift from the front and not throw any weight on your back. Would you? Would no, I wouldn't that? say that. No, I would say more functional than the front squat would be a deadlift. Okay. Because if you're going to, if, you, if a couch is here, okay, let's say here's a couch, right? Right? So, all right, so you're going to move this, just move it away to get to the, to the wall back here. How are you going to get to it? How are you going to get to it? You're not going to do, you're not going to do this. Uh, let me see. You're not going to do this. You're not going to do that. You're going to go here. You're going to go here, you're going to go, and you're going to try to get in there or something. So you're going to do this you're going to get that ugly squat. Mm -hmm. You're going to use as much knee as you can get without the knees hitting the That's thing, cool. and then the rest is going to be over. How do you pick up a UBS box? You can't use a front squat. You won't get there. Your knees won't let you get there. So you got to get that ugly, ugly thing going to get your, your hands around the bottom of the box. If you look at it, man, if you take pictures, it's there. You don't even have to analyze it. Look at it. A couple more questions here. Um, why do people slap their feet when doing Olympic lifts? Oh, that's another one. What? <laughs> what?
Why do they slap their feet? And they're using 50 pounds. It's like, no, no, I'm not kidding you. They'll, you'll see light people, weak people, whatever, that are learning the bar with two plastic five pound plates and they're going like this. Why? Why is the foot slapping to begin with? And it's obvious that whoever's teaching this has no clue of what Olympic weightlifting or the mechanics of it. The reason that you initially lifted your foot was if you were pulling from a narrow stance, like old traditional, uh, the Chinese were often doing this, they would, they would get their, their toes out like this, come on down, because when you're, when you're narrow, okay, you get the maximum height. My head will drop the wider the stance. Got it? So you were trying to pull, in a game of millimeters, you were trying to pull as high as you could to get this bar as high as possible. So this offers you the, 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 uh, a wider grip and a narrow stance offers you the maximum height. Then you lifted your legs up. The reason you lift your legs up because, is because normally you're interacting at the high level with a mass greater than yours. Action, reaction, a greater mass reacts less. The lighter mass reacts, right? So I'm here, I'm pulling myself under the bar which allows me to drop faster than gravity can bring me down. So you're trying to cheat gravity by pulling yourself against a bigger mass. <laughs> if the bar weighs less than you, there's nothing there, okay? So you wanted to receive in a wider position because it was a lower position, it was a strong squat position. So that's why it was the shuffling of the feet from narrow to wide that allowed them to hear, to get off the ground and you hear that slapping sound. Now what they're finding out is that some lifters are going, okay, I'm really strong here, and I won't even, I'll, I'm strong here, and you'll see them go like this. And they won't even come off the ground. And they go right underneath, saving this time. But that depends on how they're built, that depends on their choices, that depends on their skill set, all that. But some people, you won't even change foot position. So the reason people slap their feet was to get from a narrow to a wide. And when they're working with higher weight. Now, if you gotta go from here to here, it doesn't matter if the weight is high or not. You gotta, you gotta get off the ground to, to go from narrow to, to wide. So if you're doing going from narrow to wide, then you get your feet off the ground, that's when you hear the slap. Okay, but there's no need to get your feet this high off the ground, it's a shuffle. Okay? All right, one more question. Uh, Go over the snatch and why it's so dangerous without proper form. Oh, um, I just got my MRI, right shoulder, bad arthritis, I'm going to need soap. Now, did Olympic weightlifting do it? Maybe, maybe not. But I can tell you that I was pretty whole at about 37, and when I started doing Olympic weightlifting, I was never a full squatter, and I forced my body to do things that it didn't want to do, and I think that accelerated uh, stuff, just like boxing would accelerate, you know, uh, Alzheimer's or Parkinson's or any type of neurological. If you got the propensity to do that and you're doing this to your brain, it can't possibly be done. So if you don't have the structure and you're doing these extreme moves, it can't possibly help. So, but the, the snatch, just like the clean, but more so than the snatch, is a transition from here to bottom. The problem is that most people, like I said, can only squat effectively like that. If you don't have that, and you don't have that, that's your squat. If you're using a snatch, look at what happens. That has to be here. Look at that shoulder. That shoulder is just, you're going to receive all sorts of nasty. I mean, there's MMA holes that put the shoulder in that position so the guy taps out. So when you want to mess up somebody's shoulder in MMA, you put it in this position. Okay? That, that's how bad it is. Plus, they're, they're here. Elbows rotated, so the arm is rotated, so you're in here, okay? When you're receiving the snatch, you're supposed to have elbows in, elbows facing the bottom. So, number one, this receiving position is probably the worst thing. And if you're muscling it right here, guarantee a slap tear. You cannot externally rotate this weight. This weight has to go up, and you catch it. It cannot be here. If you're doing this, you're going to get a slap tear. So, those are the two things with the snatch. Number one, slap there from externally rotating under high loads because of poor, uh, because of poor form. And then the receiving position with a compromised structure. 
that shoulder is going to get it. So, stand in for what? And for what? What are you doing snatches for? For power? Please. There's, there's no reason to do this lift in any sport that I know of other than Olympic weightlifting. I'll go on the record. No reason to do it. Got it? All right, we'll see you guys in a couple weeks when Jason gets back from China. Take care.